So, good evening and welcome everybody. And welcome to this yet another episode of Single Surgeon Live webinar series. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Yogesh Panchwa, who will be talking to us on 10 points to ponder on while treating a giant cell tumor of the bone. We also have our expert panelist, Dr. Chetan Anchan. He is also an orthopedic oncology surgeon from Mumbai. So over to you, Yogesh, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Ashok. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, right at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Sancheti Hospital and Auto TV for uh, giving us this particular opportunity. And uh, special thanks to special thanks to the panelists for today as well, Dr. Chetan Anchan, uh, who's from Mumbai and who's going to sort of moderate and uh, pose some queries uh, on behalf of the audience. Uh, the reason for talking on uh, uh, giant cell tumors is that uh, it's a very common benign bone tumor that orthopedic surgeons get to see. Almost 20% of all benign bone lesions are giant cell tumor. I'm sure that most of the audience that I've tuned into have seen one or many of giant cell tumors in their practice uh, up till now. And hence, uh, there are many, uh, uh, I would say, misconceptions. There are many theories that keep on floating around. And there are a lot of queries also as far as uh, the correct approach to treating giant cell tumor is. Also, there have been quite a few uh, recent developments and uh, not all of our colleagues are adept of what's the latest that's been going on in uh, treating the giant cell tumors and hence the selection of this particular topic. So let's go through all the 10 points and to start with, the question is that are all lytic lesions which are well defined in a bone which present to us say with a patient of uh, age range say 20 to 40 years are all of them giant cell tumors. And you know, we will take this particular case of a 42 years old homemaker who presented to the orthopedician with a pain in the left knee of three months duration. And you can see that there is a very well-defined lytic lesion in the epimeter diaphyseal region of the distal femur with a breach in the anterior cortex. And uh, this arose, uh, arose to the rise to the suspicion of a giant cell tumor which was arising in the distal end of the femur. And the MRI that was done for this particular patient also did mention a differential of a giant cell tumor. Now, we have to be careful in approaching such type of lesions. We have to keep in mind that the lesions that could look like giant cell tumor may not really be giant cell tumor to begin with. And whenever we see a lytic lesion in the bone, one thing that should come to our mind is to rule out any metabolic disorder. And hence, we need to think of other biochemical markers to be done in these particular patients. The alkaline phosphatase in this patient was very high and hence we got a parathormone level done, which turned out to be 327 with a higher normal being around 72. And hence she was investigated with a ultrasonography of the neck and a systemic scan to rule out a parathyroid adenoma in the neck. And lo and behold, she did have a parathyroid adenoma in the right lower uh, uh, parathyroid gland. And this was then excised and she need not be actually treated for the lesion in the distal femur. The, the left hand side shows you the x-ray at presentation and on the right hand side she went on to develop a pathological fracture but she was splinted and two months after the parathyroid adenoma was excised you can see that the lesion and that particular fracture has gone on to heal well and she has been mobilized. Hence it is necessary to remember that not all well-defined lytic lesions presenting to us uh, uh, in a bone are giant cell tumors. We need to investigate them appropriately before managing them as a giant cell tumor. Otherwise, we would be you know, sort of over treating the patient when there is no need of that. The second question is that when such a patient comes to us, comes to our OPD, how do we investigate that particular lesion? So obviously, local x-rays of that uh, entire length of the affected bone are necessary. We need to get a chest x-ray also done because we know that in about 1-6% of the cases, we may have pulmonary metastasis of even a benign giant cell tumor. The routine lab investigations that, that we do preoperatively had to be done. And as I said, including serum calcium levels, alkaline phosphorase levels, phosphorase levels and if necessary, parathormone levels also. MRI definitely helps us in deciding our biopsy site and in managing the patient in the future. And whenever possible, we couple the MRI scan with a CT scan of that affected bone. Usually distant staging as we do for primary bone malignancies like a bone scan or a PET scan is not necessary in a giant cell tumor. 
unless and until you are suspecting a metachronous or a synchronous giant cell tumor, which means that the patient has multiple giant cell tumors in different areas of the body, which is extremely rare occurrence and not these particular distinct staging investigations are not usually done unless and until there is a very strong clinical suspicion of synchronous multiple giant cell tumors presenting at the same time. The next question, point number three, that should come to our mind is, no, this, this is a common question that is asked by a lot of our colleagues. Why shouldn't we operate a giant cell tumor directly? Why should we just waste time in doing a biopsy, wait for the histopath report to come in, and then uh, do a surgery? Why to subject the patient twice uh, into bracket an unnecessary sort of an investigation, according to most of uh, them? Well, I will share this particular case with you of a 35 years old lady who came with a painful swelling in the lower end of the tibia and her x-ray showed this particular classical well-defined lytic lesion with septations, uh, no obvious uh, cortical breach uh, and extrusion soft tissue uh, component. And this was treated by a colleague of ours uh, thinking that this was a giant cell tumor. And uh, curettage was done, bone grafting, iliac risk bone grafting was done, K wire fixation was done. She was okay for the next nine months, but at nine months duration from the surgery, she presented with a uh, painful and increasing swelling in that surgical site. And this is how it came back to us. And the X-ray at that particular time showed that it was actually an aggressive uh, lesion, which now showed a very big periosteal reaction, extrusion, soft tissue component with a lot of osteoid. And this on biopsy was proven to be an osteogenic sarcoma and she had to be treated with, a, with chemotherapy and bilony amputation. Uh, thus, it is always mandatory to do a biopsy before we decide to undertake any major surgical intervention because this may complicate the patient's situation in certain scenarios. Another point or the fourth point I would say how to stage or grade giant cell tumors. We had been told by our teachers that there is a pathological grading system for giant cell tumors, which now we don't follow for deciding the treatment. There is a radiological classification that we follow now, which is which was described by Dr. Kamparaji. There are three grades, grade one, grade two, grade three. In grade one, the lesion is completely intraosseous, as you see on the left-hand side of the screen. There is no cortical thinning and expansion, and there is no soft tissue uh, mass of that particular component. In Kampananchi grade 2, the bone may be slightly expanded, there may be slight cortical thinning, but there is no extraosseous soft tissue component that is type 2. And type 3 is where you have a cortical breach and there is a soft tissue expansion in the muscles. Now, these particular three grades are, you know, give us, provide us some pointers towards how you would be managing uh, that particular case in the future. And type 1 and type 2 are the cases where probably, probably, uh, most likely we will be deciding upon an intralesional curettage. And in type 3, we may decide to do a curettage or we may decide to do a resection based on the further imaging uh, information that is available to us. So that's how the radiological grading system is going to help us in management. And a pathological grading system is now no longer followed. There are various modalities of man uh, treating a, a giant cell tumor in the bone, especially in the extremities. We are all aware of that. Most common of that is surgery, which involves either an intralesional curettage or a marginal or a wide excision. For giant cell tumors, which are located in difficult areas, we would sometimes employ serial angioembolization to before we do an uh, operative intervention. Nowadays, there has been a lot of study and a lot of light has been thrown on the use of newer drugs like bifosphonates and denosumab in managing the giant cell tumor. And obviously, uh, radiation that was used uh, earlier for uh, giant cell tumors, which were located, say, in the spine or in the sacroiliac region, is now avoided, obviously, because of uh, the limited use and uh, the risk of malignant transformation uh, in the future. The next point that comes to our mind while treating a giant cell tumor is that how to choose the right treatment. Now we have discussed that there are multiple modalities. How do we choose the right modality for a particular case? Well, curettage, which is very commonly employed in treating a giant cell tumor, is done in such cases, the three of them that you see on the screen, where there is a good cartilage, the joint has not been invaded by the giant cell tumor. And the extraosseous soft tissue component, if at all, if there is any, is there in only a limited plane, maybe one or two planes. 
So after curettage, you know that in all these particular three cases, you are going to get a good bone stock on which you can base your reconstruction on. And you will be able to do a reconstruction as well as save that particular adjoining joint so that to give the patient the best possible functional outcome. So curettage is going to be meant for these particular cases. But then sometimes not all patients present to us in very early stage. In certain cases like this distal and radius giant cell tumor, you can see that it's a very, very big mass with extraceous soft tissue component. The joint has been destroyed. The, actually, the lateral view did show that the carpus was, carpals were dislocated, molar voids. There, was, there would be poor bone stock remaining behind. There would be no bone left behind to do any sort of a reconstruction. This has to undergo a resection and not a curettage. In this proximal humerus case, you can see that there is a flattening of uh, the joint and the cartilage probably would be uh, destroyed and the patient would not get a great functional outcome. And hence, this is again a case probably where you would think of doing the excision. There are certain cases where there could be multiple recurrences, as in this distal femur, multiple procedures were done, the joint has been destroyed, the tumor probably is invaded into, invading into the joint. These are the cases where you would again think of resection. A proximal fibula, which is an expandable bone, giant cell tumor in such a location is uncommon but not unseen or unknown. This is the case where you would probably think of resecting the tumor as well as uh, giant cell tumors located, say, in a bone like the ilium, in this particular case, where you would do, again, a uh, resection and give the patient the best possible oncological and functional outcome. Once we have started talking about curettage, which is employed in most of the giant cell tumor cases that we get to see, the question that comes to our mind is how to do a good extended curettage. And whenever nowadays we talk of curettage, we mean that it is an extended curettage and we'll come to that particular point. Curettage is what we do manually using all sharp curettes. And extended curettage is a technique which means that we have extended the tumor kill by using one or a combination of multiple modalities like using the pulse lavage or using the high speed burr, hydrogen peroxide, phenol alcohol, liquid nitrogen or argon laser, one of one or many of these particular uh, modalities so as to give a good uh, control of disease, good oncological outcome to our patients. Typically, the technique that we employ is that we excise the scar of previous biopsy or previous surgery in all these patients because uh, more than once we have seen that if the biopsy scar, scar is left behind, there is typically, if it has not been properly approached by our colleague in the past, then you may get a soft tissue local recurrence in, in that biopsy tract. And hence, we do follow the practice of excising the biopsy scar to begin with. Once we have... Uh, dissected the subcutaneous tissue and we have approached the soft tissue uh, component. We put in hydrogen peroxide soaked wasp pieces all around the cavity so as to avoid joint contamination in the surrounding areas. There could be some blood that could be oozing out once you incise that particular cortical window and we don't want the tumor cells to contaminate the surrounding tissue which will increase the chance of local recurrence. Once you do the cortical window, the cortical window has to be shaped in such a way that you can approach all the nooks and corners of the cavity by uh, just looking at it. Uh, you have to visualize all the uh, nooks and corners so as to do an adequate complete curettage. And for that, the window has to be sized adequately and should not be very small in size. We should be using very good instruments, very sharp curettes, because this is the most important step of doing the curettage, where we can sort of see that once the manual curettage is done, you can almost see that the entire tumor has been taken care of and maybe only some microscopic tumor tissue is left behind. Pulse lavage has to be employed so as to sort of remove this particular loose tissue, which may be hiding in the cancellous bone in the epiphyseal and metaphyseal area. Uh, dental burr is one uh, very good instrument to look under the roof of that cavity so that you're not missing any tumor tissue over there as well. What are the adjuvants that are employed when we talk of an extension of uh, the curettage? High speed burr is one of the most common adjuvants and the most important adjuvants that can be employed. This particular high speed burr actually takes care of all the uh, ridges that can be seen on the industrial surface of the cavity. And these particular ridges may be hiding the tumor cells, which have to be tackled, which have to be removed, so that the chances of local recurrence are minimized. Once you have done that, you could use hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide has been shown to be safe for the soft tissues, plus 
tumoricidal for the stromal cells of giant cell tumor, which are the two tumor cells and not the giant cells. And this again is a very effective way. Uh, we have we have we are currently employing the use of high speed bar pulse lavage and hydrogen peroxide and almost about eight to ten years back we have stopped using any chemical contrations contrization which we were using in the form of phenol and alcohol to begin with uh, or maybe liquid nitrogen in some centers is used but nowadays we have stopped using it the phenol alcohol as a combination has to be used in a particular fashion if you want to use it remember that it has to be used in a cavity which is completely you know surrounded by bone you cannot use it when uh, the posterior soft tissue uh, so posterior bony cortex is breached and the phenol could sit uh, behind and then cause damage to the neurovascular bundle the phenol is then taken on a swap stick or a peanut and then applied to the entire endosteum endosteal surface of the inner surface of the cavity a continuous suction has to be used while doing that some contact time has to be given for the phenol to act and then the phenol since it's not soluble in uh, saline we have to use alcohol to uh, make it soluble and then suck it out with the suction that is being in use liquid nitrogen is not something that i have been using uh, in my practice it is being used at some centers and it increases the tumor kill by rapid freezing and thawing cycles the depth of penetration of liquid nitrogen is pretty high. It is almost more than a centimeter. And it has to be very, very carefully used because it causes a very high rate of necrosis and high rate of soft tissue and wound healing complications if it is not carefully used. The other adjuvants are equally effective. And hence, as I said earlier, we have stopped using this chemical cauterization techniques. One more adjuvant that you could use, and some surgeons I know are using, is the use of the cautery on the industrial uh, surface so as to uh, utilize that particular technique to increase the tumor, uh, tumor kill. Uh, there have been studies and there have been meta-analysis that have been published in the, over the last decade, which have shown that meticulous mechanical curettage and completeness of the curettage is what is the most important factor that uh, decides the local recurrence rates and probably the adjuvants are not very important but nowadays there have been certain uh, literature and the certain papers that have come out which have shown that cement is probably an one useful alternative or adjuvant which could in fact reduce the local returns rate so this particular statistics will keep on changing and the experience is different with different uh, centers so once we have done a good adequate extended curettage the next point to ponder on is to how to reconstruct that particular cavity do you use a bone graft or do you use a cement and we all know the pros and cons of using either the bone graft and the cement bone graft is a very small cavity fantastic uh, alternative it's uh, it remodels along the stress lines and once it's incorporated the reconstruction is almost permanent obviously the drawbacks are the limited quantity the morbidity that is associated with the donor site recurrence is pretty difficult to uh, spot early vis-a-vis -vis bone cement which is considered to be cytotoxic because of the monomer as well as because of the hyperthermia that is associated with it another point is that it gives a early mobilization because of the strong mechanical support that it offers and recurrences in this around this particular bone cement as in this particular case is are spotted very early and hence you could intervene very early in case of local recurrence the only concern in using a bone cement just next to the articular cartilage is the degeneration of the articular cartilage because of the heat and because of the proximity to the bone cement and this has to be adequately addressed when you do a reconstruction so how do we decide how do we decide to use a bone graft or cement well this is one particular case a distal femur latipondyle giant cell tumor you can see that it's reasonably smaller in size if you see the x-ray and the mri you know that you're going to get more than five millimeters of good subchondral bone for reconstructing even after you do an extended curettage and here is the this is an ideal case to do a pure bone graft sort of a reconstruction without having to worry about the subchondral bone as you can see the intraoperative picture showing you more than 5 mm of subchondral bone remaining behind and it has been reconstructed very easily using only bone graft techniques and uh, cancellous screw fixation and on the follow up two years down the line you can see that it has uh, you know uh, united beautifully the bone grafts are united with the host bone beautifully and this patient has a fantastic functional outcome Consider this particular distal femur case now. Now you can see that particular giant cell tumor extends right up to the articular cartilage and hence you know beforehand that once you have done the extended curettage, there will not be any subchondral bone that has been left behind 
for you to sort of uh, do your reconstruction on the basis of. So that's the interoperative picture after doing a complete curettage. I can see that only a thin, flimsy articular cartilage is left behind. It requires a good type amount of support and maybe a sturdy support. And in this case, probably taking you know advantage of that sclerosis in the subcondyl area. What we have done is that we have put in a plate first and then packed in the rest of cavity using bone cement. And this particular bone cement then gives a good mechanical support early mobilization is possible in this particular case. Patient can go on to have an early knee ROM and full bed bearing. So this is a case typically where we have not used uh, uh, bone graft subcondrally because we are not sure whether that will give an adequate support to the articular cartilage or it will lead to a collapse of that articular cartilage because that particular support has to be really, really very good. We can use a combination of the two, which is uh, we all know about the sandwich technique, where we sort of uh, pack uh, subcondrally a bone graft, keep a gel foam on the top of it, and then pack the rest of the cavity uh, uh, with bone cement. And it probably combines the advantages of both the grafting technique as well as the cementing technique. And in this particular case, you can see that even though uh, uh, you know a subcondral cancellous bone graft has been used, mosselized bone graft has been used, it has gone off to heal beautifully and the patient is uh, having a very good functional outcome and without any local recurrence. Another common point that is raised is, what if there was a pathological fracture in a pre-existing giant cell tumor? Does it need, does it mean that it's more aggressive? Does it mean that we have to excise that particular tumor? Well, that's not the case always. This is one such case, a distal femur, very weakened bone obviously goes on to have a pathological fracture and it can be uh, addressed in a similar fashion as we have seen the earlier cases. And a sandwich type of a reconstruction along with a internal fixation device has been utilized in this particular case. And the patient goes on to have a good function with no local recurrence. Ninth point to ponder on, what is the role of the newer modalities in the management of a giant cell tumor? So can we utilize something else in treating these tumors? We have heard of solandonic acid. We have heard of a new molecule, new kid on the block called denosumab. When do we use those? Does it mean that surgery is not going to be required? Well, it has a role definitely. And for that, we have to understand what is the basic cause of formation of a giant cell tumor. It basically starts because of the uh, overactivation of the osteoclasts, the pre-osteoclasts rather, which is because of a protein called as a rank ligand which is secreted by the precursor osteoplast cells. And this particular rank ligand is the causative agent among for the osteoclast to become hyperactive and then cause a lot of lysis in the bone and that leads to giant cell uh, tumor formation. So lanonic acid is one of the molecules that has been shown to be very, very effective in you know, sort of stopping this particular upregulation of the stromal cells and maybe cause them to differentiate into an osteoblastic lineage and have a tumoricidal effect sort of it gives a more long lasting uh, uh, long lasting activity compared to denosumab and this is what is being used by many centers uh, to sort of disc decrease the local recurrence rate uh, one dose or two doses preoperatively followed by two or three doses post operatively after a curettage has shown to reduce the local recurrence rate in many of the studies that have now been published the other molecule that has currently been introduced is denosumab, which is a fully human monoclonal antibody to the rank ligand that I was talking about a couple of minutes back. This particular antibody goes and binds to this particular rank ligand and prevents it from activating the osteoclasts. And that's why the osteoclasts undergo an apoptosis and then the osteoblast function takes over and the giant cell tumor goes on to show some sort of mineralization and osteoblastic activity. Well, denosumab is not a molecule that we use in multiple, in all the cases of giant cell tumor because we have now learned from our experience that it causes a lot of problem uh, once we use it and then we have taken the patient for a curettage because the curettage then becomes very difficult. It's very difficult to identify and to stop. And hence, den denosumab is a molecule which we don't employ in all the cases. In select cases like this one, the distal femur, uh, sorry, distal tibia giant cell tumor, where there has been a loss of tissue extension, uh, you want to preserve the ankle joint because the ankle joint architecture and the anatomy is fairly well preserved. You want something to base your uh, or to uh, make your curettage very effective. And that is where a few cycles of denosumab, modified cycles of denosumab have been used. You can see the wonderful bone formation in the soft tissue that 
that is seen in these post delosumab x rays. And here, denosumab has helped in sort of downstaging the tumor, and then the surgeon can go in, make a cortical window, cure it out that fibrotic, whitish looking giant cell tumor. And once it has been completely excised, be very careful to go right up to the uh, far end of that particular fibrotic tissue, go up to the you know, bone as seen on the radiology and complete the curettage and then do the reconstruction, whatever suitable may be. In this particular case, a cement and an internal uh, fixation has been done. And this will help in converting a probable resection into a curettage. So these are the cases where denosumab is used. Another case where denosumab is put to use is a case like this, a large giant cell tumor in the distal end of the radius, where it's a very, very big mass. It has been neglected. It's a recurrent giant cell tumor. You can see the size of the tumor on the X-ray and the MRI. And here, if we do an upfront surgery, there's going to be a lot of intraoperative spillage and an increased risk of local recurrence. So these are the cases where uh, we employ denosumab preoperatively maybe use three or four doses. This patient was given four doses and you can see that there's a very good bone formation in the soft tissue component, but still the anatomy is completely destroyed. It requires surgery to be done and it has been treated with excision on the distal end of the radius with the entire mass and a single bone forearm with uh, ulnar centralization of the carpus on the ulna and the sarcoidosis using the plate. And that is how with from this sort of a picture, post denosumab new bone formation out there too, and easily done, uh, I would say comparatively easily done uh, resection of the distal end of the radius and with arthrodesis, and the patient gets a good functional outcome with minimum risk of local recurrence because you have avoided the spillage of the blood and the tumor cells in the cavity. Not always we will get a fantastic new bone formation. Some cases do not give us a good osteoblastic reaction post denosumab, as was this case of proximal humerus giant cell tumor, which did not show radiologically a good mineralization. But intraoperatively, we found that the shell was hard enough for us to do a good excision and then reconstructed with the help of a prosthesis. The axillary uh, now was paired over here, and so was the deltoid, and the patient had a reasonable amount of abduction, not a full overhead abduction, but reasonable amount, amount of abduction and a control on the rotations and flexion extension of the shoulder joint as well. So this is how denosumab in this particular case has again helped in making the resection easier. Another case, a sacral giant cell tumor uh, in a 40 years old housewife, a very crucial location. If we decide to operate, probably excise, she, would, she has a high chance of ending up with a uh, bowel bladder deficit. If we decide to curate it, there is a high chance that she will have a local recurrence because of the residual disease. And this is again one case where denosumab can be employed along with angioembolization, maybe along with solendonic acid, so as to give a long-term control. Uh, another area where denosumab is used well is pulmonary metastasis of giant cell tumor. Uh, these are extremely rare situations, but we do get to see it in about 24% of the cases. And here, denosumab can be either used in a new adjuvant setting to make the resection of the pulmonary met, uh, meds easy, or it may be used as a definitive modality if the pulmonary metastasis are very extensive and inoperable. What is the cost of denosumab? It was very costly, but now there are certain biosimilars available. So the cost can be anywhere between, say, 13,000 with a biosimilar to about 24,000 to the original molecule uh, per dose. The dosing that has been advocated by the literature is four weekly, with the first month having a loading dose on day eight and day 15. But we have sort of modified this particular dosing now based on our experiences of high local recurrence rates uh, after doing a curatage post donosumab. And we typically use two or three doses based on the intent of our surgery about what is to be done. Now, denosumab is not a panacea. It is not a one-stop answer to all giant cell tumors. There is a uh, there are literature reports which have talked about a secondary malignant transformation in cases of giant cell tumor which have been treated with denosumab and this is a matter of uh, serious concern. Even uh, multiple uh, series have now been shown that this is a real danger that uh, is posed. Another issue is that the denosumab has a tumory static action and not a sidal action and hence once it's stopped the stromal cells will grow back again and a giant cell tumor will grow back again. So. This is not going to be a permanent answer. If for some reason you have to put the patient on a permanent treatment with denosumab, then the dosing will have to be modified, but then you have to deal with the other 
uh, complications like osteonecrosis of the jaw, etc. The original research group that uh, came up with the use of denosumab for giant cell tumors uh, has recommended it as for the first option of treatment in inoperable or metastatic giant cell tumors and not in the regular giant cell tumor where you could go in and operate the tumor up front. Outside the clinical trial setting also, they have said that it is for the treatment of locally advanced tumors to facilitate complete surgical resection or avoid mutilating surgeries and nothing else. And maybe it is of extreme use in unresectable and metastatic diseases. But this is, these are the cases where we will be using tenosumab and not in the routine upfront uh, curatable and reconstructable cases. There has been publication uh, now coming from Indian authors as well, which has shown that curatage after giving denosumab has a big local recurrence rate to the tune of 44% to 60%. And hence, we are very, very careful of using it in cases where we are planning to do a curatage. Probably it's a good option when you want to resect a tumor, but not such a great option when you can do an upfront curatage. What about uh, a recurrent giant cell tumor? What if it what if it comes back? The point is whether it is really more aggressive. Or does it require a very aggressive treatment? Does it require an excision? Does it require amputation? Well, the case is that you don't really uh, have to worry about the aggressiveness. If the pathology is conclusive, it is the same type of a giant cell tumor, and you can approach it the same way that you have approached a primary giant cell tumor. Meaning by if you are able to do a resection and do a reconstruction. You can still go in as in this particular case, which was bone grafted, patient had a local recurrence. Again, it was pretty difficult to spot this local recurrence in the follow-up. But it, we went in, removed the earlier bone grafts, removed uh, the entire reconstruct, and then did an extended curatage reconstructed using only bone cement and internal fixation. So it is possible to salvage the joint and salvage uh, the outcome as well, doing an intralesional treatment in a recurrent giant cell tumor also. But there could be certain cases which present to you very late, as was this particular distal femur GCT, where the joint was destroyed, it was not reconstructable, and hence had to be resected and reconstructed using a megaprostatic sort of a reconstruction. In a metastasis, pulmonary metastasis, as I mentioned earlier, there is a 1 to 7 percent risk, but these are usually very slow growing not life-threatening in most of the situations and you could go in, do a pulmonary metastatectomy, use denosumab in uh, indicated cases and still the patient will have a good functional outcome. I thank you all again for your patient listening. Thanks again to Sanjay Hospital and Ortho TV. And uh, I will uh, now stop and uh, uh, allow Chetan to uh, pose questions. Yeah, you guys. Uh, yeah. Can you? Yeah. Second talk, I think you have covered the subject so well that I really couldn't think of much, uh, you know, uh, that was missing. But just a few thoughts, you know. Yeah. Uh, like say, sometimes when you do a biopsy, I'm assuming you will do a biopsy of every suspected case of, you know, lighting lesion in the bone. That yes. is what you advocated. Yes. So you do a especially where of... we are planning a major surgical intervention. Right, 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 yeah. right, right, right. Yes. Or where you are radiologically suspecting it to be a giant cell tumor. Correct. Can I say it like that? I mean, you suspect it yes. to be a giant cell tumor, but yes. you still don't call it a giant cell tumor till you read the report which says Correct. that it is a giant cell tumor. So sometimes, this is my experience where, you know, you send the tissue to the pathologist you get a report which says that this is a giant cell rich lesion. Yeah. Now, how do you respond to that? I yeah, mean, does right. it really yeah, mean yeah. it is giant cell tumor? Yeah, that's right. And it's a good question because, uh, see, giant cell rich lesion uh, could mean anything because we know that there are quite a few other benign bone lesions which have giant cells as a uh, sort of an... Uh, uh, adjunct uh, on pathology. So, and we do see giant cells in other uh, tumors as well. We need to have a very conclusive report, not just a giant cell containing lesion. And for that experience in doing the biopsy and doing it from the right side in the right way is very important and very critical. We need to ensure that we have given the pathologists a very adequate material in the first place on which they can open. Usually with giant cell tumors, it is not a big problem. We can easily get adequate tissue uh, on which the pathologist can report, but we need a conclusive report. You may ask for uh, a second review if you need from a very experienced pathologist, but 
if this is the case, if the diagnosis is not very conclusive, then I would strongly suggest repeating the biopsy. And that's a, usually a needle biopsy that we do in uh, giant cell tumors to yeah. prove that it is a benign giant cell tumor that we are dealing with. So, just a report of giant cell rich lesion, do you think it is safe enough to go ahead and do keratage? Because does no, it imply I yeah, I be wouldn't be, sorry, I wouldn't be really very comfortable, uh, okay. you know, uh, treating uh, on such just such a report because we have had enough instances where the lesion looked benign, it was reported as a giant cell rich lesion, and then it has turned out to be a say a giant cell rich osteosarcoma, for example. Okay. We have had reports, uh, we have had cases uh, uh, in that particular of that particular type and nature, and we have burnt our fingers. So typically, unless and until there is a conclusive report. I would advocate not going ahead. Great. Now, uh, yeah, now regarding biopsy, I mean, would you recommend an open biopsy or a needle biopsy? I mean, the whole issue is you need to get adequate tissue to the yes. pathology. Yes. In fact, uh, the if you look at the principles of biopsy, uh, the yeah. principles are that you need to have adequate tissue. You need to be going in only through one compartment, stay away from the joint and stay away from the neurovascular content. Right. And our body area. Now, this is possible in a very good fashion when you do a genital biopsy in a giant cell tumor. And uh, if you, when you are doing an open biopsy, you are basically do, probably risking a lot of contamination, a pathological fracture, and you are taking tissue only from the superficial area. You are not able to reach the depths of the lesion. And you know you want to target all the areas so that you get representative material from most of the area of the lesion. That is the basic of uh, doing the biopsy and that is all possible with a, with a needle biopsy which can be done even in uh, local anesthesia on OPD basis in most of the cases and that's the reason why we don't advocate doing an open biopsy because it sometimes or more often leads to problems rather than uh, helping us and uh, with a good technique uh, you can have more than adequate tissue in a giant cell tumor which will help the pathologist to give you an accurate diagnosis. Now, the next question is, you know, you did share a case of uh, hyperparathyroidism, which yeah. was, you know, look like GCT. So, do you recommend that every patient where you suspect it could be GCT or which looks like that, you should, you know, at least do some work up to rule out hyperparathyroidism or yeah. it is just a... Uh, yeah, exactly. So typically hyperparathyroidism will have other telltale signs also on the x-ray. There would be sort of an osteopenia in the other bones. There could be other multiple lesions, lytic lesions, if you look carefully and if the, if the x-ray has covered those particular areas. The appearance is a little different, but if uh, to an untrained eye, if you have to avoid doing this particular mistake, then the easiest way of adding one simple investigation is to add a serum alkaline phosphatase and serum calcium levels. Uh, to the preoperative investigations. And if the alkaline phosphatase levels are very high, then you could ask for a parathormone level. Typically, this particular approach has saved us from, you know, has helped us, in fact, from uh, detecting a lot of parathyroid adenomas when we were suspecting uh, giant cell tumors. So you don't have to do a parathormone level on every patient? It is not just... every patient. Not every patient. Only if the serum alkaline phosphatase levels are very, very high, if, the, uh, if there is hypercalcemia, uh, then I would start suspecting a Brown's tumor of hyperparathyroidism and then ask for a um, serum parathormone level. One more thing that I saw in those photos that you shared is uh, while curating a giant cell tumor, you kept, you know, gauze soap and hydrogen peroxide uh, all around. Yes. So what was the idea? I mean... The idea there is to prevent contamination because if you're treating a giant cell tumor upfront, the giant cell tumor is... All you know, sort of, uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of blood inside, and a lot of blood keeps on oozing out also in the surrounding uh, bone and surrounding uh, areas. And you don't want the cells to be lodged in the soft tissues uh, while you are doing the curettage, unknowingly cause a contamination over there, which may lead to a local recurrence in that area. So that's the reason why we keep hydrogen peroxide soap wash pieces all around so that uh, we can uh, prevent the contamination and then uh, reduce the local recurrence rates in that particular area. We have to be extremely careful uh, while doing the curatage that we are not causing any spillage in the surrounding tissue. So basically you're implying this giant cell tumor of bone can actually recur in the soft tissue, independent yes, it may. of bone. it may. And I've shown you a case where the biopsy tract uh, did show a local recurrence. 
the bone lesion was completely okay the cementing okay. that was done was perfectly fine but there was a small nodule in the subcutaneous area in the biopsy tract which uh, led to a local recurrence in the soft tissue okay so this raises a concern that this kind of you know giant cell tumor yeah. can be then implanted anywhere in the body oh, yes. if you are Typically, not careful yes and that very commonly happens when you are doing a bone grafting uh, we have to be very careful of using uh, different instrument sets while we are uh, taking out iliac crest bone graft say for example and we have seen cases in the past and you also have uh, mentioned a few cases where you have experienced a, a, a contamination on in the iliac crest bone graft site which caused a local recurrence later on in that area not just the primary uh, site of the tumor but also the iliac crest bone graft site that is something that has to be taken care of so typically a good thing to do is that use completely different set of instruments for bone grafting site uh, to change the suction cannula to change even the cautery tape and change the instrumentation when you are harvesting the bone grafts i generally prefer a separate trolley you know Correct. for the bone grafting part of the procedure that's so right. sometimes i do it before i actually cut the tumor yes yes that way you so avoid it yeah the reason i do it later is that i get an idea about the volume of the cavity amount, amount the type of, of graft that you need absolutely the amount of graft the shape size i typically don't borsalize nowadays so i want a perfectly sized and shaped not perfectly or near perfectly sized and shaped bone graft that i can decide right. once my extended curettage is complete right right now whenever you are using an implant whenever you are you know doing a reconstruction especially after a curettage <clears throat> what kind of you know material would you prefer to use if you have a choice with the you know metallic implant that you use yeah uh, typically what we have done till date is that we have uh, sort of evolved in using the implants we had we have used all sorts of plates uh, uh, that were available in the market and currently we are very happy using the anatomically uh, designed uh, and shaped uh, plates lock compression plates that are the most uh, easy because they are uh, because of the fact that they are anatomically shaped uh, nowadays we do prefer some low profile implant uh, in certain cases that need very little uh, augmentation for mechanical support and we have preferred a simple a dcp or a l plate or a t plate also in certain situations because we just need something like an rcc reconstruct uh, some metal along with that cement to prevent uh, the rotational forces causing an uh, fracture in the cement later on uh, okay now uh, i mean i i was just thinking about what material would you prefer a titanium implant or oh, yeah. an ss if implant possible, yeah yeah if possible yeah sorry i missed that particular point if yeah. possible oh, yeah. titanium implant because it enables me to get an mri scan done later on if uh, a local recurrence is suspected yeah so there is always a concern about you know follow up in this patient this is yes. not the you know end surgery so at some yes. point and yeah. probably an mri might pick up disease earlier than an x ray especially True. my between... problem the you know in cert- some cases a couple of cases that i have experienced with a titanium implant is the cold welding that occurs and then it becomes extremely difficult to remove the implant uh, later yeah. on if uh, if it it's needed to be removed and that's a really really a uh, big headache uh, in these particular tumors because you had want to remove the cement you want to remove the plate and then the screws have been cold welded uh, with the plate and that that's that's an extremely uh, you know problematic situation because that's not even half the surgery done yet and you have landed <laughs> up with a cold welded implant Okay, one more thing that I saw is where you have put the implant with all the screws in place, and then you pack the cavity with the metal. Yes. Now, yes. God forbid, you you know reach a situation where there is a local recurrence in that. Yeah. Uh, do you face any problem with removal of this? You know, no, we implant? don't. Uh, we don't. We typically sort of we are able to remove. That's been our experience. We are able to remove. We take care that uh, there is no cement leakage in between the screw and the plate uh, where they are getting locked onto the plate. Uh, and typically we are able to remove most of the screws well uh, we don't the screws have done yes. they don't get they don't get stuck inside the cement and uh, sometimes we have had to break the screws also uh, we had to burr through or we had to break the screw heads and then remove it along with the block of cement when we have used blunt osteotomies and hammers to remove the cement inside we have to be extremely careful not to damage the host bone while uh, doing so so while using this kind of uh, reconstruction you don't actually drill into the cement after the cement has set 
I when you are putting a plate to, like that. I personally, I don't prefer to drill after the cement has set. I prefer to put in the screws first and then pack in the cement. It's just yeah. a, a much easier technique and which, uh, in my experience, hasn't caused any problem if an implant removal is required later on. I, agree I, would, I wouldn't be removing a common question that is asked is whether you should remove the bone cement at a later yeah. date and replace it with bone grafts. I haven't right. felt the need to do that. Patients typically do not have much of an issue with a plate and a cement inside. And uh, typically, unless and until there is a recurrence, I wouldn't be thinking of removing the implant and the cement. Sometimes the patient asks you, you know, they are not worried about the cement, but they always have a concern about the plate. The do you think the plate should be removed? After, yeah, I tell yeah. them, I tell them preoperatively that this is going to be, if possible, this is going to be a permanent reconstruct. I hope that you don't have a local recurrence, and uh, if there is no local recurrence, I wouldn't be removing the, uh, removing the implant. And that's where probably a bone graft reconstruct uh, has kind of an upper hand because there I can give a choice to the patient that okay, if the bone graft unite well and there is a good amount of remodeling. I may think of doing a implant removal at the end of say two and a half three years, especially if I have used a stainless steel implant. So that is where, again, uh, if the patient is very keen, I would try and use uh, bone grafts. And we have successfully used aloe grafts also in some of our cases where we had an access to uh, an aloe graft uh, from the bone bank. And the patients have gone off to have a good union and healing and they have been planned on. But not in the case of a uh, cement reconstruction. Sometimes, you know, really, you know, we do see local recurrences, say, after 10 years of a primary surgery. Do you think it is any different from a local recurrence which happens, you know, in a year or two or even earlier? The, the only thing is that it, they are very common in the first two, two and a half years, uh, local recurrences in that regional area in an operated giant cell tumor. Uh, I wouldn't be much worried because we know that a few giant cell tumors do recur after say 10 years, 12 years. Uh, and I have had a case where a GCT has recurred after 18 years of the index surgery. The index wow. surgery was done by someone else. So yes, late recurrences are known. Uh, if need be, we can get a fresh biopsy done just to prove that uh, it's still a benign giant cell tumor and then go ahead with uh, the same approach uh, that was used for treating the primary. Or that would, you you recommend, the would you recommend doing a biopsy or you feel it is you know if it is more than eight to ten years i would prefer to do a, a repeat biopsy just to see what it is if uh, a radiological uh, clues can also be uh, there you if you are well if you are good in reading the radiological clues you could make up but just for being correct as far as the protocol is concerned, I would be more comfortable repeating the biopsy if it's a recurrence after many years. If it's a recurrence only one, one and a half years down the line, uh, I will decide that based on the radiology, whether it's a very aggressive lesion, whether we have missed a malignancy to begin with, then I would do a repeat biopsy, not always. Now, the, the other thing that I noticed is the kind of burr you are using. That is yeah. a very high quality, high absolutely very high speed burr. Yeah. Do you yeah. think we can use a burr head on a regular drill because everybody may oh, not yeah, have yeah, a burr? Yeah. The regular drill is a very low speed drill. When we are talking of high speed uh, in the burr, it's uh, 70,000 to 80,000 rotations per minute. And uh, the simple drill that we use for drilling in the screws and with a burr on that is not going to give us that kind of an uh, RPM. So that is not going to be useful. You need to be using uh, high speed uh, burrs and those, those are now easily available even if uh, an orthopedic setup doesn't have it, probably our ENT colleagues of, or our neurosurgery colleagues will be having that kind of an high speed burr and they can easily lend us uh, that equipment for our surgery. So it's something that is mandatory. We need to have a very high speed burr when we, uh, when we do the extended period. So of all the adjuvants that you use, you feel that is the most important uh... it is very very helpful it is extremely helpful to cut down the time of the surgery to enhance the completeness of the curettage uh, though i don't uh, give a lot of importance to that particular meta analysis that i have shown because their control group uh, there were only a few cases there were only about say 30 40 odd cases in that that control group so i don't give a lot of importance to that but it just increases the quality of the curettage, completeness of the curettage, uh, according to me. Lovely. I think I have, you know, taken, tied up all the loose okay. ends, whatever they were, <laughs> if at all. <laughs>
Yeah, great. Because we probably won't be able to have questions from the audience. So right, right, right. Uh, I think you have done your. So best I just thought of also. yeah, what all could come in the mind of correct. you know. Correct, because I I couldn't obviously include everything in the talk, uh, but some lovely questions from your side, which probably are the common ones, or they they keep on occurring in uh, our colleagues' minds most often. Right. Okay. Yes, I think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Panjok sir, it was really exhaustive and thank you. Dr. Chetan made it really interactive. Uh -huh. so, thank you very thank much. You. Thank we'll, you very much. Thanks we'll for the